Morning. 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 You know, as I was studying this week and uh, began to read several different places, and I read a lot of things, a lot of different chapters and things that Paul had wrote. And you know, the more the more that I read of Paul, and not only him, but the whole Bible, there's so there's so many different lessons that we can learn from the whole Bible. But there's so many just real life lessons that Paul applies to me and you, and all of his writings. And you know, part of what we're going to talk about today is found in Second Corinthians chapter three. <laughs> and bring it up on the screen. But here in just a second. I want us to look at what Paul brings out here. It says, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. So as Paul was writing this, you know, I began to think several different things as I was reading this. And I, I began to think a lot about uh, a lot of our professional athletes that we have nowadays. In, in the beginning of this scripture, it starts talking and it, and it leads us to bragging some, okay? And it leads us to what we use to judge ourselves. And there's so many of the athletes that we see today that that's what they want to do. They, they want to brag about themselves all the time. They want to talk about how good they are, how much better they are than somebody else. And, you know, so many times they like to brag and they like to talk a big talk, but it's actually their numbers or their stats or what really does the bragging for them. Because if your stats are so much better than somebody else's, it must mean you're playing better ball than they are. But if you're just running your mouth and there's nothing to back it up, then you're not doing any good. See, it's the ones who are quiet and just let their game do the speaking for them. They're the ones who are doing something good. You know, there's a big difference in being a Christian. You know, I think there's... I think there's three different ways that a lot of us try to be Christians. And one of those is we try too hard. Because have you ever met that person that bragged and bragged and bragged about going to church and bragged and bragged and bragged about how great their church was and how awesome this was and how great that was and then five minutes later they, they wasn't talking so Christian-like anymore. You know, it was just something to make them look good. And then you have those who go to church and then on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday when somebody mentions about going to church, they don't want to let anybody know they went to church. They try to keep it a secret because they don't want people to know that they go to church. And then you have people who go to church and are proud to serve a living God, who are proud to be a Christian, who are proud to be a part of a church family, who are proud to go and to serve God every chance that they get. And not only proud of that, but proud to tell others about what it's like to be a Christian. 
proud to tell others about what it's like to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul started out here, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? He said, are we beginning to brag about ourselves? He says there in verse 2, you yourselves are our letters of recommendation. You know, many times people when they go to apply for a new job or something, they'll have somebody write them a letter of recommendation. And you know, basically, Mike, all that letter is is, I want you to tell these people how good I am. It's basically what you want it for. You want to tell them that you're going to do a good job and it's better coming from somebody else than it is coming from yourself. So it says here, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation. Paul's saying, I don't have to brag because my works do the bragging for me. He's writing this letter to the people that he has previously preached to. The people that have went on and began and have continued to do God's work even after he moved on. He's saying, I don't have to brag about what I've done because you guys are carrying it on today. And you know what? It don't matter what the name of the church is that we go to or what denomination it is. If we truly believe in God and we truly have Him down inside of our heart, then that's something that we can brag about this morning. We can brag about being a child of God. It don't make us any better than anybody else. <laughs> But we can brag about it. Because God loves everybody exactly the same. God loves me the same as He does anybody else. God loves all of us the same as He does a sinner. He cares about every single one of us. You know, this... Paul's ministry was a ministry of righteousness and of the Spirit. That's what we've got to be today. We've got to make our ministry a ministry of righteousness and a ministry of the Spirit. And when I say that we have to make our ministry, that doesn't mean just a preacher. That means that everybody who is a child of God. Because everybody in here can be a minister for Christ. You may not be standing up here and being the preacher, but you can still be a witness and sharing your love for Christ with others around you. And we need to use the righteousness that Jesus gives us whenever He saves us to share His Word with others. To be a Spirit-filled ministry. You know, there's not a thing that Rodney or Richard or myself can get up here and say to you that can make any difference in the world in your lives. There's not anything that we can say. But if we allow God to speak through us, it can make a big change in your life. And you know, so many times, I've heard people say before, well, I think, you know, the preacher's just picking on me because he knows my life. And he knows what's going on in my life. But you know, there's so many times that I get up here and preach, and, and I preach to myself as much as I do anybody else. Sometimes I feel like I, I, I'm just preaching to myself and there's nobody else even here. Because God works that way. God has a way to get to you this morning. God has a way to get to me this morning. And it may be one thing that's said that gets you in something totally different that touches me. How do we become righteous? How do we have a righteous ministry? How do we become righteous? There's only one way. That's through Jesus. Jesus is the only way that we can become righteous because there is nothing in us that is righteous at all. But through Jesus, we can become righteous because of His blood being applied to our lives and His Spirit being poured down upon us. We can become a righteous person. And it's only righteous people or saved people who are going to make it into heaven one day after a while. He says in the third verse, and you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. You know what? You can wear a shirt around if you want to that says, I am a Christian. 
or you can get on Facebook or Twitter or wherever and you can, you can post something that says, I am a Christian. But it means nothing. If it's not written on you with the Spirit of the living God. Because I can say things all day long. But if it's not written by the Spirit, if the blood's not applied by the Holy Spirit this morning, then there's nothing that's going to make it any good. No matter how many times you say it, no matter how many times you tell others, no matter how many times you think it, if you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart and His Spirit has not filled you up, then it's not going to do any good to just say, I'm a Christian. And here's the cool thing. If you allow Jesus to come into your heart and allow His Spirit to fill you up, you won't have to say that you're a Christian. Because people will see it. The Bible speaks several times about fruits and the fruits that we bear. What kind of fruits are you bearing this morning? Are you bearing good fruit? Or are you bearing rotten fruit this morning? The Bible says that if we are a Christian, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, that we should be bearing good fruit this morning. If we're bearing good fruit, that means that our light should be shining. That means that it should be shining bright this morning. Because it goes on and it says that it's not written on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. So it's not something that's written on paper or written on stone. It's something that's down inside of us this morning. You know, in the Old Testament, when they were under the law, there were so many things that they had to do. So many different sacrifices that had to be made. Blood that had to be applied above a door to save lives. There were so many actions that were required for us to be able to make it through. But when Jesus came and Jesus died on the cross, and His blood was shed for me and for you. Those actions went away. That don't mean that we don't still do things for God. But now all it takes to get saved is for the blood to be applied to our heart. For us to ask the Holy Spirit to come into our life is what it takes now. It don't take all of the physical works anymore. It don't take because it's not about what me and you do. It has nothing to do with what we do. It has to do with what God has already done. That's what writes it on our hearts this morning is the things that God has already done. Christ, He was the righteous one. Jesus was the righteous one. God sent Him here simply for me and you. He came down upon us because we are made righteous of God in Christ. And without God, we're nothing. But with Him, we are so much. With God, things are amazing. With God, things are absolutely great. You know, it says, it says over in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, it says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, I want you to think about for just a second what it said over there in 2 Corinthians where it said that they couldn't even look on Moses' face when he came down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments. They couldn't look at His face because He had been so close to the glory of God and it was shining so bright. They couldn't look at Moses. But you know what? We have a chance to get so close to God today because we can have His Holy Spirit down inside of us. We can have Him with us every step that we take. We can have Him with us everywhere that we go. We can have Him with us at all times. All we've got to do is take Him inside of our heart. It goes on and it says, and all are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption 
that is in Christ Jesus. So it don't take my works to get saved. It don't take my works to go to heaven. It takes Jesus Christ for me to go to heaven. It takes His works. Him coming and dying upon a cross and shedding His blood for me and offering His amazing grace to us. That's what it takes to go to heaven. We are justified by His grace as a gift. A gift. A gift is something that somebody gives you that they don't expect to get back and that you don't have to pay for. Jesus, He done all of this because He wanted to give us a gift. He wanted to give us something that He's not going to take back. That you can't give back and that you don't have to pay for. Because it's free. Because He's already paid the ultimate price for every bit of it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, we've heard it many times throughout our lives that there's only one perfect person and that was Jesus. We all have sinned. We all have struggled. We all have fell short. But you know, none of that matters if we have Jesus in our heart. Because he, wipe, he wipes away all of the old. Behold, all things become new. And when all things become new, we have something positive in our life. We have something good to look forward to. We have a home for all of eternity in heaven waiting on us. It says in the 25th verse of Romans chapter 3, it says that it is to be received by faith. Faith. What is faith? Faith is simply believing in the things which you cannot see. That's what faith is. It's believing in something that you don't even know is there. I've had, I've had people ask me before, how do you know that God's real? I'm sure many of you have been asked the same thing. How do you know God's real? Because I do. Because I feel Him. And He talks to me. And He's there any time that I need Him. He's there even when I don't feel like I need Him. He's still there. He speaks to me. He corrects me when I'm wrong. He helps me to grow and to become stronger. He leads me down the path that I need to follow. That's how I know that God's really real. It's because I feel Him down inside of me. You know, I was asked not too long ago by a person who claimed to be a Christian for many years. And he said, I don't understand people talking about God talking to them. He said, I've been a Christian for 20 however many years. He said, God ain't never spoke to me. He said, I ain't never heard God talk to me. And you know what I think the problem with so many of us is? We're not listening. We're not listening. We don't want to hear it. Because you know what? Sometimes the things that God wants to tell me and you are not the things that we want to hear. Sometimes the things that God speaks to us are, are not exactly comfortable for us. Are not exactly what we want to do. You know, I, I've tried since I became a Christian to, to pray about decisions that I have to make in my life and, and to ask God which way I should go. And you know, there's been times that God has gave me an answer and I've been like, yeah, you know, are you sure? I mean, should we ask God if He's sure? Because I'm pretty sure He knows what's best for us. But so many times when I get an answer from God and it wasn't the answer that I wanted to hear, I'm like, yeah, maybe I'm just thinking that. Maybe that was just my imagination. Maybe that wasn't really God. Maybe I should pray about it a little longer. Maybe I should think about it a little harder. 
you know, so many times the problem is we just don't like to hear the word no. When we want something, we want it. I can't speak for everybody in here, but I can speak for myself that I'm a very impatient person. When I want something, I want it. I don't want to have to wait on it. But God does all things in His time. And God knows when the right time is right. God knows when the right time is. He knows that right now you're not ready for it. But next week or next month or next year, you may be. So don't give up hope. That's the thing with God. He don't work for me and you. He don't do things on our time schedule. We should be looking to Him to do things on His schedule. We should be looking to Him to work for Him. And if you're not hearing God speak to you, you need to find out why. Because He will speak to His people. You may not hear. You know, I think so many times people are looking for this, this loud, deep voice that's going to speak to them when they're listening for God. I'm not going to say that you're not going to actually hear God speak because God can do all things. But there's so many ways that God can speak to you this morning. God can speak to you through a song. God can speak to you through somebody preaching. God can speak to you through reading His Word. God can speak to you simply praying. God can use somebody at Walmart to speak to you. You've got to be listening. You've got to be ready to hear God's Word. Because that's the problem with us. We get so busy and we get so tied up and we get so concentrated on things of this world that God becomes second place. And when God becomes second place, we're not going to hear anything that He says. Because God is very jealous and He wants to be number one in our lives. He doesn't want anything else to come in front of Him. He wants to be number one. He wants to be at the forefront of our lives. And, and you know, I can tell you from trying in different ways myself, you know, I've had God number one in my life and I've had other things in front of God in my life. And my life goes so much smoother when I have God at number one. Things go so much smoother. Do I still face problems? Every single day. But if I've got God at number one in my life, then He's right there and I can turn right to Him and I can say, God, I need Your help with this. And, and the awesome thing about it is, is that He's already there working because He knows what you need. How many times does the Bible say things like, ask and you shall receive? Knock and it shall be opened. But how many times have you said these prayers like this? Dear Lord, I, uh, I guess I need your help. Man, go to God confident. Go to Him proud. God, I need your help with this. God, I need you to lead me in, in the right direction. Even if it's not the direction that I want to go, I, I need you to tell me. Even if it's not what I want, I'm still going to follow you. I can remember in elementary school on Wednesday mornings, we would have a little church service. And we sung the same song every single Wednesday morning. It was, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, still I will follow. You know what? It don't matter if your mom or your dad or your brother or sister or your best friend or whoever it is. If they don't want to follow Jesus, you still need to make it a priority for you too. Because maybe something that you can say or something that you can do or something that they will see may make them want to follow Jesus. But here's the deal. When you decide to follow Jesus, you've got to decide to follow Jesus. You need to make that a priority in your life today. 
And you know what? Talking to you today, maybe you have been saved, but maybe right now God's not a priority in your life. Maybe right now God's not number one in your life. Maybe there's something else that is at the forefront of your life right now. And I don't know what it may be, but you do. You know what's number one in your life. Did you want to get up and come to church this morning or did you just come to church because, well, it's Sunday? And that's what we do on Sundays. Did you come to church this morning looking to get something out of it? Looking to get a blessing from God? Or, or have you just been sitting here the whole time wondering, how long am I going to be here? How much longer is this service going to last? Because I want something to eat. Well, that's the kind of things that tell us what's priority in our life. Because if we came this morning looking to get a blessing from God, if we came this morning looking to see what God was going to do in our lives and in the lives of the people around us, and if we came this morning not worried about what time it is or what time we get to leave and, and not worried about what might happen this afternoon, but focusing on God this morning, that's when we see good things happen. That's when we see our lives become better. That's when we see our relationship with God become stronger. Because you know what? If you go looking for a blessing, you'll find one. If you go looking for something good to happen, you'll find something good happening. But if you go just wanting to rush through the motions and get it over with, that's all you're going to get. You're just going to get rushed through the motions and get it over with. But let me tell you something. Once you've, had, once you've had a true blessing from God this morning, you'll want more. You'll want more. You'll want them all the time because they're amazing. And once you've had some chastisement from God, you won't want any more of that because that's rough. It don't feel good. It said in the 26th verse of Romans chapter 3, it was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We're not good enough. We're not good enough to make it to heaven. But with Jesus, we can be. Jesus makes us good enough. He makes us perfect for everything. But what's number one? What's your priority this morning? What are you thinking about today? Just one little commentary that I read on some of the Scripture. It said their hearts were humbled and softened to receive the impression of Jesus by the new creating power of the Holy Spirit. For us to receive anything from God this morning, our hearts have got to be humbled. Our hearts have got to be humble to get anything out of Him today. Why? Why? Why do we even come about an altar of prayer? Because we need to get humble. Walking down in front of everybody and bowing down can be scary sometimes. But the only reason it's scary is because the devil's trying to talk you out of doing it. But walking down here and getting down on our knees shows God that we're coming to Him humble. And God's ready to hear our prayers when our knees hit the floor. He's ready to listen to anything that we have to say because that's the awesome thing about God. He's the best friend and the best listener that you can ever have. He'll listen to you complain. 
You know, eventually your friends will get tired of listening to you complain about stuff. God won't. He'll continue to listen. And then if you'll be quiet, you'll just listen. He'll teach you how to get over those complaints. He'll show you what to do to become a happier person. He'll show you what to do to become a better person. It may not be that you're a bad person now, but there's room for all of us to improve. Maybe you're just not happy with the life that you're living right now. Give God a chance. Have you, have you asked Him to make you happy? To make you appreciate the life that you've got. To put a smile on your face. Man, because let me tell you, if you've got Jesus down inside of your heart, you ought to have a smile on your face this morning. Because it's something special. You should be filled up with pride this morning that there's a Savior that cares so much about me and you that He laid down His life for us. And if you've accepted Him into your life, there is nothing better that has ever happened to you. So this morning as Rodney sings and plays and whatever he does, what's the priority in your life today? What's number one? Is it you? Is it your wife, your kids, your family? Or is it God this morning? Are you happy with the way things are going? Is your life going good this morning? Can you honestly say that you're proud with the life that you live? Because if you're not, I'm going to tell you. God, He can offer all the change for you today. He can put a smile on your face that just won't go away. If you will stand this morning, let's see place.